So, smile or PRK in the presence of mild dry eye disease. My financial disclosures. You know, it's long, let's go back a little bit in history and let's think about this. There's been, it's long been accepted, generally accepted that it's better to do PRK than LASIK if there's a little bit of dry eye. But there's one study and it's the only study that has been properly conducted to compare these two procedures in dry eye. And that was a beautiful study done by Steve Slade, Dan Jury and, and, and Perry Binder, where they demonstrated that the, as you would expect, there's much more discomfort uh, in PRK in the initial phases after the surgery the, up to one month, but at six months, three times more patients were reporting dry eye sensation in the PRK eye than in the LASIK eye. So this is the only properly conducted contralateral prospective trial. And it turns out that PRK eyes are more uncomfortable at six months post-op than LASIK eyes. So again, looking at evidence sometimes contradicts the general um, feeling out in the community when you're just talking about corridor discussions at the meetings. So this is very important. Let's look at some of the other disadvantages of PRK, which are that if someone has a dry eye, we know that there's a bigger propensity towards developing haze. The other thing we know is that PRK renders the cornea forever more susceptible to haze formation, late haze formation, when there's an increased exposure to UV light. Here's a patient of mine that I had done minus nine PRK and she ended up with a great result, slight regression by three months. But she called me three years later and said, look, my vision's dropped a lot. And when I, she came in, it turns out she was almost minus three and a half. And when I took a more careful history, it turns out that she'd just come back from a vacation in the Caribbean. And you know, we don't get a lot of UV in the UK, but she went to the Caribbean had a lot of UA exposure and look what happened. This is a high frequency ultrasound scan showing the stromal surface here, but this is the original PRK surface and in between was a lot of neostromal deposition. So she activated her myofibroblasts and laid down a lot more stroma to the tune of minus three, a uh, minus three lenticule. And of course I had to do a PRK to remove the haze and then use mitomycin to stop these myofibrils from activating again. So let's talk about the unique aspects of SMILE. And everyone knows about the mechanical and the innervation and the retreatment options, but we'll concentrate on the innervation advantages. Diagrammatically, this figure is all over the world now, um, done by Tim Archer in, in our group. We're demonstrating that SMILE, if you do a SMILE with at least a 130 micron cap, you're actually gonna be taking the stromal tissue out from beneath the nerve plexus that runs in the anterior uh, cornea. LASIK, of course, with femtosecond lasers, we're making thinner flaps. Well, those are inside the nerve plexus. And then we ablate the nerve plexus. So we know for a fact from all of the publications in the literature on, uh, on uh, uh, using cochet bonnet astrogeometry that LASIK makes the cornea quite insensitive on post-op day one and it recovers by about a year to the pre-op levels. We know from the SMILE studies uh, that the cornea only is slightly anesthetic on day, parasthetic on day one, probably from a neuropraxia, but that this recovers very, very quickly within a month or two to pre-op levels. And this has been shown confocal microscopy uh, from Mario Nubile. You can see here the, the LASIK flap has the uh, corneal nerves cut. You can see that in flex, it's the same because it's basically LASIK, but in SMILE, we still preserve the corneal nerves after a SMILE procedure, whereas down in the SMILE interface location, we are cutting nerves. So this is all understood. Let's look at comparisons of LASIK and SMILE. And these are very interesting. First of all, you can look at meta-analyses of retrospective studies of all the studies looking at SMILE, uh, Shermer's test changes versus LASIK Shermer's test changes. And you can see that SMILE has a slight advantage on the Shermer's test over LASIK, which, did, which showed basically a decrease in Shermer's. The tear breakup time, interestingly, was, was not changed much by SMILE or um, LASIK. Both were decreased. 
Um, in the Quirk study, the quality of life impact of refractive surgery correction, this was very interesting because there was a statistically significantly better result with respect to dry eye sensation after smile than LASIK. And when we look at the morphology study um, and the, the dry eye, objective dry eye metrics, subjective and objective dry eye metrics study, this was really interesting. The OSDI score from LASIK went up from pre to post-op, but stayed the same for the smile. The dry eye questionnaire DQ5 went up um, with LASIK, but stayed the same with smile. The osmolarity uh, was the same between the two procedures, but the tearful meniscus height uh, decreased after LASIK, but not after smile. And the non-invasive keratographic breakup time was worse after LASIK, but the same after smile. So we have a lot of objective and subjective measures here demonstrating an advantage of smile over LASIK in dry eye. So what is the preserved treat, pre preferred treatment for a patient with mild dry eye? Well, first of all, we have to take a very dry eye, uh, very detailed dry eye evaluation of every patient that presents for refractive surgery. And this preoperative dry eye management that will ensue following this evaluation is what is going to dictate whether we can do surgery on these eyes or not. And, you know, we have lots in our clinic, we, we apply all of these tests to every single patient who presents to us, whether they're having corneal or lens surgery. Uh, and I want to make a little shout out here to the SM2, which is, you know, phenomenal work from our friends in, in Japan, where they're using a capillary action to um, basically suck up the tear film meniscus with no anesthetic. And this is a direct measure of the tear film volume present at baseline. And this is a way better test than, than the Shermer's test uh, for evaluating tear film volume in the aqueous component. We know that pretty much 95% of people that present with meibomium gland dysfunction or background inflammatory dry eye conditions, they can be managed and, they, and these eyes can be made suitable for corneal or lens surgery. New technology now in using infrared imaging for looking at the actual meibomium glands and looking at meibomium gland dropout. Interestingly, meibomium gland dropout, we now learn, is caused by long-term soft contact lens wear. So there you are, contact lenses again. Um, but we know that LASIK and SMILE, you know, really can't be performed if you have, um, you know, very big dropout of meibomium glands and meibomium gland disease, because then you really get into a, 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 a vicious circle. So what is the preferred treatment for a patient with mild dry eye? Well, you know, if you've evaluated the patient and managed their anterior corneal surface, uh, external eye, you may be able to, to render people uh, as candidates for surgery, but we have to be cautious um, in terms of, you know, in, embarking on this. Overall, however, if you're gonna choose the procedure that is most likely to be um, uh, best for the patient, clearly, I think it's obvious, SMILE is probably the most appropriate treatment as it's the procedure that has the least impact on the anterior corneal nerve plexus, um, the least impact on subjective and objective measures of dry eye post-op, and the most likely to recover quicker if there is a, a fragile or a borderline external eye or anterior corneal surface uh, uh, dry eye situation. Thank you very much.